Today I want to talk a little bit about uh, Riemann-Roch. It's a tough theorem, or there are tough versions of this theorem, and I like to compare the difficulty of mathemat mathematics with rock climbing difficulties. So instead of going just into the more difficult parts of mathematics or climbing, I mean, we have here some scales, you might have seen the movie uh, free solo with Alex uh, Honold or Don H Wall, which is also a very tough climb. And here, these are the toughest thing Dura Dura and Silence. You find that on YouTube. It's just pretty amazing what these guys can climb. I myself kind of uh, got stuck somewhere here in the intermediate level. So, this is a range which you can reach without much, you know, special training. But also here uh, in mathematics, there are different levels uh, which you can uh, use to access theorems. And there is a classical theorem of Riemann Roch, which is, a, I think, it's an intermediate difficulty. You find lots of uh, resources on the web, and actually, the best resources I've found are written by students, undergraduate students who have written down. Uh, the theory, not in books, like algebraic geometry books, which are usually just too abstract. So they are going more into the, into the difficult part. But the idea is uh, very simple. And I myself got into this in graph theory. There is also a version, uh, I call this the baker norin riemann roch theorem. There are various versions and various people have worked on this. It's a combinatorial version of Riemann Roch, which is uh, it looks the same, if the formula is the same, and like in the case of uh, Riemann surfaces. But what I want to do today is kind of a, uh, have my friend Pikachu. <coughs> so uh, I've also the Disney figure. So the Pikachu is the Japanese answer to Mickey Mouse. Pikachu is a, a old friend, and uh, the simplest version which we can formulate of Riemann Roch is just when you have one point. Very, very, very simple uh, geometry. One point, but you have already kind of an interesting geometry. And the geometry which we can do there, this Riemann Roch geometry, is something you can do without exactly pre calculus. It's just dealing with functions and piecewise continuous functions. And uh, so some two piecewise continuous functions add up to <laughs> another. Uh, nice uh, function. But let me just quickly just maybe uh, go through the uh, three versions. So there is this uh, classical Riemann Roch. By the way, there's just uh, the Riemann Roch theorem for a, I mean, a Riemann surface. That's kind of a, that's a compact Riemann surface, a sphere. It's the simplest one. That's the genus one with one hole. So G is the genus of the surface. It's just the first Betty number if you want. And uh, so uh, in, in complex Betty number. So I like to think about this like this as uh, uh, the Euler character. So one minus G uh, is the complex Euler character. But if you look at it as a real surface, then it's two minus two G. For example, if you were triangulated and you count the number of vertices, number of edges and number of faces, then the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces is two minus two G. In this case, with G equal to one, it would be zero. It always adds up to zero. In this case, it would add up to two. That's the Euler gem formula. <clears throat> and uh, so that's the Euler characteristic. So it's just, a theorem deals with geometries, with surfaces. These are one dimensional curves over the complex. And then there is this notion of divisor, which is kind of a little bit you know, strange when you look at it in the, in the continuum. So you excite finitely many points and the excitement value can be an integer. So this can be positive integers, can be a negative integer, it can be zero. Most of the points, actually all except finitely many points, have zero excitement. So the excitement only happens at finitely many points. And 
then you add up these excitement values. I like to think about them as energy values, kind of quantum mechanical energy, integer of energy values which you have attached, and then you add them up, and that's kind of the total energy, which is the degree. And then you can add up the degree to the Euler characteristic and think about this divisor as a geometric structure itself and the Euler characteristic is the Euler characteristic is then just a degree plus the you know, complex Euler characteristic. So that's also the same here in the graph case. So what you have is a, you have an Euler characteristic. If you look at the graph, this graph is considered a one-dimensional curve. That's the kind of <laughs> strange point of view which graph theorists have taken in the second part of the last uh, century. You have split it away from topology, you know, all this giants like Hopf or Alexandra, so they thought about graphs differently, but then graph theory has separated and it has become a kind of a, just a, a one-dimensional theory, but you can do that. I mean, it depends on the simplicity complex which you take. So we can always take like this graph, we can take just the simplicity complex. We don't look at triangles. And then the Euler characteristic is just the number of vertices minus number of edges, and there is only there are only two there are only two etinum B B zero and B one. B zero is one because it's connected. We always deal at Riemann Roch always deals with connected geometric spaces, and then uh, G is the genus. That's the analog of the genus, the number of holes which you have in a in a in a graph. And then we have the Kirchhoff matrix. We talked a lot about this Kirchhoff matrix. It's a, and the zero dimension of Laplacian. And uh, here in this case, we have then uh, an equivalence relation between divisors. So you call div two divisors, you call them equivalent if uh, their difference is just, uh, it's, a, it's a principal divisor, a divisor coming from a neuromorphic function on the surface. And here it is equivalent if, it's <laughs> if, if the difference is the, in the image of K. So that plays the role, the image of K plays the role of the neuromorphic uh, functions. And uh, that's also then called, if you just change such a such a, uh, a image value, this is this is also called chip firing, because what you do is you take the chips which are uh, here on, on one of the uh, vertices and you distribute it on all of the neighbors. And so that gives you an equivalent divisor. And so the big question is then in both cases, is so, uh, when do you really are you are you uh, no more <laughs> underwater, right? How much do you have to add so that you have an effective divisor or uh, equivalent to an e effective divisor? Effective divisor means that the energies are positive or zero. That's from a physical point of view also natural, and for me it is natural also because once you have that, I can associate with this a quiver. So you can also look at these divisors then as you know, loops, you can add them as, as, as loops. So, so for me, this is a geometric object. The divisor is a geometric object, just we have the, these uh, loops. In general, these loops also have negative, kind of have, can have negative value, but once you are interested in the case, when are they, you know, how much do you have to add to get them positive? And that's this number L of D, that's the dimension, which you have also here. It's the dimension of this uh, complete linear system, so. So that's uh, classically quite important if you want to understand meromorphic functions and meromorphic one forms on a Riemann surface. And uh, the Riemann Roch theorem tells you something about, you know, looks everywhere the same, tells you something about this number L of D. And then you have a, also a notion of a, a canonical divisor, which is here actually quite interesting in this case, it's just minus two times the, the curvature. The curvature is a number which you get when you just take the, uh, you know, the, at, at every vertex you have one, and then you subtract half of the number of edges which come in. So this is kind of the negative value which you have attached to the, to the, the negative value which you have attached to the edges are going are spread to the vertices, and then you have the curvature. But it's minus two times the this curvature, and so when you add them up by gauss boner you get uh, minus two times the Euler characteristic. It's the same thing here. So that's the that's the thing. It's called the canonical divisor, and uh, you might think about why why do we have that? Why does this come up here? Uh, here it's very natural in the in the in the classical case because there is just up to equivalence one neuromorphic one form, and then you look at the, the degree is well defined. So that degree, so that or that 
divisor is up to equivalence well defined. That's the canonical canonical divisor. For example, for a sphere, it would be just uh, uh, at, at one point at infinity two minus two minus two attached to it, uh, infinity. So that's the thing which you have here, and then the theorem tells you it's kind of uh, something more, more combinatorics, quite interesting combinatorics. Uh, I got into this also because I got interested in in uh, trees, spanning trees. So the uh, pseudo determinant of k is the number of spanning trees, and that's then kind of here in this case it's the the number of elements in this in the Picard variety which you can define here. It's just the, all the divisors uh, which have degree zero divided by uh, by, uh, by this uh, equivalence uh, uh, relation. Just take number of equivalence classes, number of equivalence classes of divisors, so, which is quite an interesting notion also here. In this case, you have just a finite torus associated to it, and then you can go from the divisor to the torus with this abel jacobi map. So it's a very classical, uh, classical uh, uh, complex analysis topic. Here it's kind of more, nature, nature is more combinatorial. Combinatorial, but it's not what I want to talk about uh, here. This is kind of still quite you can you know, uh, do, but you have to prepare like uh, you know climbing the Matterhorn. You have to you have to prepare for that. You cannot just do it without. You have to be in shape. It's a it's a climb of a couple of uh, hours. So I, I I actually this I did not do the I the North Face, but I did this is kind of the hardest thing I climbed myself. And uh, so in this case, it's a 700 meter wall, which was a quite a tough climb, but it's still kind of considered, you know, inter intermediate. I think the difficult things start then uh, afterwards, and I'm not even going into that because I don't actually understand this very general uh, versions of uh, Riemann Riemann wall. I want instead of going here, I want to go even more uh, more uh, easy and kind of take the most simple situation which you can imagine and the most simple situation is when the geometry is just one point if the geometry is one point so you have one vertex no edges and uh, this the, the, the divisor is then just an integer attached to this uh, to this point so which is just an integer so that's a divisor and there's no equivalence class because the, there's no <laughs> interesting uh, Kirchhoff, Kirchhoff matrix. Actually, the Kirchhoff matrix is, is the zero one times one matrix. So that's kind of a not very, very interesting. So in this case, K is just, a, so it has a, it has, it has a, it has zero rank dimension is, the, the rank is zero, the kernel is one. So that's, so in this case, B0 is 1 and, 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 and there is no cohomology yet. And then the canonical divisor is minus just minus 2. Take this from here. So there is no degree. The degree is 0, so it's minus 2. And uh, you might ask, you know, why minus 2 or so? But if you look at the, the, the formula which you actually have, you take this and translate it into kind of the language here. So this asks you how much do you have to, so what is the maximum Kind of in this case, we don't have to add anything uh, because we have we are already all we are, we are already out of water here because the g is added. The g value this gives you already a value one. So if the if the divisor has a value uh, k, it's kind of you think about this as a k plus one. So what happens here in this case? That's the that's this function zero maximum of the zero d plus a g. So you can actually kind of this is. This is a, a pre-calculus. This is the function f of x is equal to the maximum of 0 and x plus 1. So that's the graph x plus 1. And that's the graph 0. And you take the maximum of these two graphs, the maximum of these two functions. And then you get this broken piecewise continuous function here. So that's the L of d. D is just this integer, it's just evaluated only on integers. And then you can look at the mirrored, so you mirror it. So in this case, you just mirror it at that point, minus one, minus D, minus one, minus D. <laughs> so that's this function. This is this graph here is the function 
minus x, the slope is negative, minus 1. If, if it's 0, it's minus 1. And that's the maximum, that's the zero graph. So that's the maximum of zero at minus one, minus six. So, and then when you add these two functions up, that's what happens in Ring and Roch, you add, add these two functions up, you get just a function, uh, the other characteristic of d, which is actually just a function one plus six. One plus d. <clears throat> so the one is the point which you have because the geometry itself already provides you a value of one, and then the, the, these are the additional, additional energy that you, that you have. So that's the pikachu riemann roch theorem, and I stop here. Uh...